فمن يهديه من بعد الله افلا تذكرون صدق الله العظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا رب العالمين First of all, I want to thank, mashallah, the PT Embassy for inviting me, mashallah, not only inviting me, but putting together this event. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about one incident of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. In Ibrahim alayhi salam, he actually asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, about how Allah ta'ala recreates. Allah ta'ala then responded and asked, that, what do you not believe? Ibrahim alayhi salam said that of course, قال, uh, that of course I believe, ولكن ليطمئن قلبي. But I'm just asking so that my I can get contentment in my heart. Any potential doubt can be dispelled. MashaAllah, what number one was initiated this year, MashaAllah, of asking questions, surveying, MashaAllah, that, that's getting to the ikmanan and getting to a point of contentment that we have in our iman. And for everyone who responded to the survey and is now attending, this is, inshallah, a step of us, towards us, fortifying our iman. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make this initiative and other initiative a means of us fortifying our iman, inshallah. That being said, my assigned topic is one which is uh, difficult, uh, it's challenging, and quite frankly, it's one which can be uncomfortable. The reason why is that it actually comes from a good place, this level of discomfort, and maybe the the place it comes from and the lack of it being spoken about comes from what we would say is haya within a person. What we feel would be haya within a person. That we feel uncomfortable talking about certain uncomfortable topics because we have this quality of haya. Basically this level of morality within us which will encourage us towards good and will refrain us from doing anything which is inappropriate. And it actually, this comes in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-haya is shu'bat min al-iman. That having this quality of haya is one of the branches of our iman. That a person being a believer in Allah and a person being a person of having this morality or this modesty, they can't be separated. But despite this hadith, Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, wallahu la yastahyi min al-haq. That Allah Ta'ala doesn't shy away from the truth. That Allah Ta'ala will say what needs to be said, Allah Ta'ala will ordain what needs to be ordained. So how do we reconcile us having haya or desi desiring to have haya while Allah Ta'ala is saying, Wallahu la yastahyi min al haq and that He doesn't shy away from the truth. The reconciliation of this, or the way we can understand this, is that for the truth to be upheld, sorry, for iman to be upheld, and for the the backbone of Iman, which is Haya, for that to be upheld, there needs to be something which is, uh, uh, the truth needs to be spoken. By speaking the truth, by establishing the truth, by having events on our Islamic positions, then Haya can be upheld as well as our Iman, by extension our Iman can be upheld. So exactly what are we talking about today? It's two topics I was given, inshallah, only 30 minutes. So, inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day, the end comes from Allah ta'ala. We're just the conduits, so we ask Allah ta'ala allow us to say what needs to be said. We say it in a manner which is conducive in, uh, to the, the listeners. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us those words which, which are pleasing to Him, inshallah, that we can all take benefit from, inshallah, we can say ameen. So now, speaking about morality, we said haya is a part of our iman. So the question is who establishes what haya, what morality is? Who tells us what is good and what is bad? The simple answer is that this comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That through the Quran, Allah ta'ala establishes what morality is and we see it through the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa As Muslims, we all know, we've all submitted to la ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah. This kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah is of course a verbal utterance and it is also the belief that we have in our heart in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But, but this kalimah of la ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah also permeates and it affects every action of a person and it also become, becomes the lens through which we see the world. That we perceive the world, what's right and wrong, through la ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah. 
Why? Because la ilaha illallah, what this means is that Allah is one. Allah Ta'ala possesses all of the qualities, those qualities which we know and those qualities which we don't know, and that Allah Ta'ala knows more than us, Allah Ta'ala knows us better than our own selves, Allah Ta'ala can establish what is, Allah Ta'ala establishes what is right, what is wrong. And this is the lens through which we view the world as a Muslim is guide of Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. And for this to be upheld, Allah Ta'ala, when every person was born, in the very famous hadith, there's very few variations, but one of the hadith, ma min mawludin illa yulibu alif kutra. Now when every person is born, they're born on this natural inclination. Allah Ta'ala naturally will put within a person the sense of what's right and wrong. But then the hadith goes on and says that as this person grows up, they'll be affected. That their parents will change them from our being, one being or another being. A person will deviate from the truth based on their environment. So we learn that la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, our, our view, the lens through which we see the world should be la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. But what might happen is that the surrounding, our, uh, the, our surroundings, the environment around us, might begin to blur these lens and will begin to blur the view, the, the, the way, the manner in which we, we view the world. And that's what we see nowadays. Before we get into what happens nowadays, we'll say that this is the only, the only logical explanation for our interaction with the world, is that this, this world view, or how we view the world, needs to become from a, an authority greater than, greater than ourselves. Or an authority which is greater than humans. Why is that? Because if we leave it to humans, number one, humans are people who are influenceable. That a person 20 years ago, what was acceptable is no longer acceptable. Or maybe what wasn't acceptable 20 years ago is now acceptable. And we see that all the time. That a person, an athlete or a celebrity, will have a tweet from 10 years ago, from 20 years ago, and now it resurfaces. And now this person can be cancelled based on what was normal. Everyone saw the tweet 20 years ago. But there's shifting morality. If we leave morality up to human beings, then how can a person know what is correct? What is correct nowadays, we will see that our parents and our grandparents died before that. So how are they going to be? Judge before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it only makes sense that our uh, the authority, this, the, uh, the authority which establishes what is right and wrong is something which is very than us. And along with that, is that when a person is ingrained in something, when we're in the, in the middle of something, it's very hard to determine what's right and wrong. For example, everyone now in the U.S. can agree that there was an immorality associated with the years of slavery, uh, slavery in, in the U.S. The way it was carried out was one which was immoral. But why did no one at that time realize that this is something which is wrong? Because when everyone is doing something, it's very hard to determine what's right and wrong. SubhanAllah, in Gaza, you would think, now how can these people who are carrying out atrocities, babies are being killed, women are being killed, that they're driving people from one area to another, at one point we would think that humanity, this level of humanity was set within these people. But then when everyone is doing something, it's actually very difficult to determine what's right and wrong. Oh, there's actually, it was an interview. Uh, people might know in Papua New Guinea. It was the last place, the last known place on the globe that practiced cannibalism. <coughs> so there was a, an interview. In the 80s, they found this tribe who was practicing cannibalism. And then after some time, obviously these people, they got you know, integrated within society at that level. So they stopped the cannibalism. In the 2000s, there was an interview <coughs> with one of the former tribe members. And one of the questions I would ask was interesting. It was, like, at what point, like at some point, didn't you realize that eating humans, practicing cannibalism, didn't you realize that this was something that was wrong? And this tribe member, he said, that look, if every, everyone was doing it, like it's hard to know what's right and wrong. When everyone around you, the people you trust, the people you look up to, the people you hang out with, when everyone is doing something, it's difficult to know what's right and wrong. So because of that, we resolve this issue of what is moral, what morality is, what right and wrong is, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who is above 
our lapses in understanding. The one was above our, the influenceability that we have. So now what we see, when it comes to how we view the world, is something that would be called, instead of this religious or Islamic worldview, is something which is called liberalism, or the liberalistic worldview. I'm sure we've all heard the term. In a nutshell, liberalism is the uh, ideology that promotes individual freedom and absolute autonomy. In other words, that people are free to pursue their desires and whatever makes them happy, and some people might add the cause so long as other people aren't affected. That a person can do what's right, they can do what they want, they do what makes them happy. Why? Because they aren't affecting anyone else. Now the issue with that is that again, even though a person might desire something, we can say that that might be something which is that it isn't good, right? Let's say a person desires to commit zina. Maybe it's consensual, but now a person before they're going to school, right? they're a teenager, and now they're the teenage child, a like teen pregnancy. You say that something bad happened. Although they wanted it, although it didn't infringe on anyone else's freedom, there was a consequence of a person trying to pursue what they so-called was their happiness. Or another thing is if a person says, look, the only way out, like, I, the only thing I want is just na'udhu to commit suicide. We say, is that moral? No. And no person will say that's an okay thing. But then what's the argument that can be made if we say a person can always do what they want, so long as they aren't affecting anyone else? And one of this, now as everyone, as this rising ideology is there of, uh, of liberalism and us doing whatever we want, one of the rising ideologies from this is what we were alluding to at the beginning, and that is the rise of the LGBTQA2S plus movement. The growth of this is something, in terms of moral shifts, I don't think that there's ever been a rise as fast and as steep as this rise. Uh, I'm not much older than all of you guys, so I'm sure you guys can also uh, relate to what I'm going to say. But growing up, this was something that was actually n n not normal. Meaning it wasn't something that was totally accepted. It's why I actually, I, you know, was always, I only attended public school. When I left in 8th grade to uh, memorize Quran, alhamdulillah, it was still something that was really people would joke about, people would call people certain names. And then when I went back in 11th grade, to the same group of guys, I realized, well, whoa, what happened in these three years? I was watching a lot of 14th Street, and I was like, whoa, oh, there, I realized within just a few days that like, there had been a drastic societal shift. And that shift has only become more pronounced and more steep as time has gone on. To the point that, subhanAllah, from Generation Z, people who were born after like 96 or 97, one in every four people will identify with this movement. And from millennials, <clears throat> certain surveys say that one in every five, 25, 20 percent of millennials uh, born after the uh, year of 1980, <clears throat> 80 to 96, 97, are identifying with this movement. <clears throat> so how exactly do, has this happened? How has this growth occurred? Before we can understand how we look at it through this Islamic view, it's first of all important that we know the background. Why? Because when we know the background, we can also begin to de de uh, deconstruct these thoughts. And we, begin, we can begin to, uh, to understand the movement. Actually, there are many things that contributed to it. But one of the main causes of the rise of this movement was there was a book that was written by a person named Marshall Kirk. He passed away in 2005. In 1989, he, he published this book called After the Ball, How America Will Con Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of AIDS in the 1990s. And in this book, he put that there were six points that a person, that society needs to do, that the, the proponents of the LGBT movement, that they need to focus on six points. And he said, if you execute it, these six points, in the book he says that there's no way that there'll be any other result that will accept the normalization of the LGBT movement. 
And subhanAllah, what we see from these six points is exactly what we see happening. And the result that he said in 1989 is the exact same thing, this whole absolute normalization. So what is this? The six points, the first point is you said you have to talk about it as much as possible, as openly as possible. Why? Because if something isn't talked about, then it's going to remain something which is strange. Right? So the more people talk about it, the more it's brought up on talk shows on TV, the more it is, you have, you know, in colleges, you have little events, you establish the LGBT uh, gay alliance in, in high schools, the more it will become normal. And it won't be something that people whisper about. Then they'll begin to talk about them, as we see now, they begin to shout about. The second point that he says is that you have to illustrate LGBT members as victims of hate. So through this, what happened was that there was sensationalism of, of the youth. That when things would happen, the detail would be bent a little bit. We would embellish the details. So now it seems, and of course I'm sure people did, I'm not downplaying maybe what may have happened, but there was absolutely sensationalism. Why? Because there's also it's clickbait or it's a way that you, know, you get people engaged, that something's gaining momentum. So let's uh, sensationalize, right, the details, and through this, this illustrated this whole movement and everyone within it as victims of hate. Now that they are victims of hate, the third point that he says is that this needs to be made into a civil rights issue. Why was this so important? You know, actually, even before we get into civil rights, there's a whole fallacy behind it, uh, or just an irony behind it, this whole movement. And to make this the basis of a civil rights uh, agenda. And that's that never in history. You know, you know the, the question comes sometimes, that give you one word to describe yourself. For all of human history, people would answer this question with something which was beyond themselves. Meaning a person would say one word, I'm Muslim. Or I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a wife, right? I'm a mother, I'm a student, I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher, whatever. But people would always identify this with something beyond themselves. And never would people say, I'm straight. Why? Because people realize that this is not an identity. It's a part of a person's life. But you don't build yourself based on this one aspect of a person's life. Now, however, we see <clears throat> that if you ask people, members of this community, to give me one word, will be now that they are, <clears throat> that they have a certain uh, sexual orientation. So based on this, that this has become their identity, they were able to make it into a civil rights issue. What, what happens in civil rights is that you don't focus on the idea behind the people. So for example, the African American civil rights movement. You weren't thinking about, uh, you weren't speaking about African Americans, you were speaking about the rights that they have, right? the integration within society. When you speak about women's rights, no one's talking about whether it's okay to be a woman or a man. It's natural. What you're talking about is the individual rights. By this becoming now a civil rights issue, the discussion shifts from, from homosexuality. Right? A discussion that all religions would be unanimous upon. And then it became a discussion on, are you going to prevent a person from working? Are you going to prevent a per, uh, serving a person because they identify with this? When, they, when this shift happened, then it put everyone, inshallah, besides Muslims, in a moral dilemma. Because now, how do you see a problem? We will say morality comes from Allah, it's a black and white issue. But if now, if we let society dictate what's right and wrong, then how can we deny when the, 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 the conversation has shift to individual rights, how can then a person deny it? And how can a person argue against such actions? After making it into a civil rights issue, the fourth thing is that they said that they need to bring LGBT members into the mainstream media. I was looking at stats. In 2023, 33% of people who uh, showed up on TV, in shows, 33% were members of the LGBT, were identified, at least in the show, as being from the LGBT community. This is a gross overrepresentation of the reality. Why? Because in reality, it's somewhere between like four to seven percent, depending on the survey. But if something is so normalized, if you see it so much, 
then it's only natural that a person will begin to think that this is something which is, it's like second nature. The fourth thing, that's right, the fifth thing, is that make anyone who criticizes it look like they're backwards. That criticize them, cancel them, ensure that they lose endorsements. So what you're doing is you're hushing any opposition. The sixth is that you establish nonprofits and you begin to fund the, the, uh, the, the, the lobby of this movement. Through these six points, what we saw is we see the results of these six points. And we see the six points still in action, but we see the results of them now. For us, we have to look at this through the Islamic view. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in, in reality, has never described a sin in the manner that that, that homosexuality has been described. This was obviously the people of the Prophet group, salam. The adjectives that are used <coughs> for the people and for the action will never see in other places in the Quran. But بَلْ أَنْ تُقَوْمُ مُسْرِفُونَ That you've gone beyond what's allowable. إِنَّكُمْ لَكَتْوُنَ الْفَاحِشَةَ مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَامِ This is a filthy act. Right? بَلْ أَنْ تُقَوْمُ الْعَادُونَ That you've gone beyond what is normal. Right? إِنَّكُمْ The Allah Ta'ala also calls مُنْكَرَ Something which is rejected. So we never see this with other sins. But to highlight the gravity of this, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has discussed it and described it in so many ways. So the question might come is how, then why do we need to speak about it? As a Muslim, what's the big deal? Why do we care what goes on in a person's private life? And the reality is that Islam, that we were publicly warned about even private sins. We would say shirk or kufr. That's a private thing a person will have in their heart, but we're going to warn against it. That if a person, we will not go knocking on people's houses to see what's going on, but when we see fahisha, when we see sin prevailing in society, it is the job of the ummah to speak about what is right and wrong in a very black and white manner. So this is not us going and, 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 and going into everyone's personal life, but we will reiterate and we will reiterate again and again until we, are, as long as we have to, the view that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has established on this. And when. The thing is that not only is this sin one which is done, but it's one that has also become public. And in most cases, the people who are carrying out the sin are doing so in a very public manner. And when a private sin becomes public, then it's also only appropriate that the, that it's spoken against publicly. You know, subhanAllah, there's certain sins that when sin is prevailing in a society, through various ahadith and stories of, and, and, and incidents mentioned in the Quran, we see people being punished, and it comes in the hadith that certain ummahs will be punished because of what's going on. And it was asked by Rasulullah that what about the people who didn't do anything, that they were the innocent bystanders? It says that the punishment will start with those people if they stay quiet on the issue. So it's our job that we speak about it. We don't go in. You know, interrogate a person, but we can uphold, and it's our job that we uphold the position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established. But this is important that we say that what is, you know, what, what is the position of Islam, and we'll say very openly that this is a sin, open sexuality is a sin, and that if we are not feeling like it's a sin, then we have to go back to what we started with is how are we viewing the issue? Are we viewing it through the lens of Islam, or now are we viewing? Islam through the, the lens of this issue. If we're questioning, man, why is Islam, you know, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah care, you know, why is you know, these uh, minor details of our life, why are they dictated, then we have now shifted from viewing the world through Islam to viewing Islam through the world. Right? If that happens, then we, you know, inshallah, inshallah, there's a, um, you know, we have to, inshallah, reach out to someone and we have to, to speak about this because this is a symptom of possibly a larger issue that we don't, we can't get into. But along with this being a sin, and us recognizing a sin, and us speaking against the sin itself, we do not individually, you hate the sin, but you don't hate the sinner. There's a, you know, a person that, although maybe they're interacting with a member of that community, the 
a generic good that you would give to everyone else, you still give to them. So if you are giving everyone a smile, greeting everyone, then you can also greet those members. That's normal. Right? That's fine. Now, what happens is that we cannot campaign for it. You know, the other question that comes is that one of the biggest uh, supporters of Muslim rights is the LGBT community. So then what happens? Don't, don't, aren't we morally obliged that we reciprocate? And morally we would say no. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so um, clear about this. That this is fahisha and never is a Muslim, whether it's this sin of homosexuality or something else, never are we allowed to promote sin. Even if we're not doing it, we won't promote the sin. So, and when this whole law, this, there's a whole double standard behind this, and that's, you know, well, you have to accept people for who they are. This is the freedom that a person has. The counter-argument to this is that if you're so all about acceptance, then we should also accept the Islamic view, and honestly the religious view on this matter, that this is something that we reject. And it should be respected that a person steps back from such campaigning and from such um, allyship. Now practically what will happen when a person, with the rise of this, issue, this um, uh, movement, what happens over time is that sins become, we become desensitized to sins. So if you're not in college, you've probably heard stories of people who are committing zina. You might know people who out of wedlock are having children. When we hear this, even if we hear SubhanAllah, a Muslim now, a couple dating, the level of disgust we should have in reality isn't there. If we see like a Budweiser um, commercial, or we see, you know, like the, the alcohol aisle on a store, there should be something within our hearts, like we should feel something. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted um, my, myself and my family the opportunity, Alhamdulillah, to perform Hajj. So when I came back, I was in the Dulles airport, and you know, for three weeks, you're in like such a sterile environment. And then I remember the first time, like in the airport I saw, SubhanAllah, like the alcohol bottles in those beauty free, free stores, I realized at that point, that's the feeling we should have. But what we become desensitized to it. And then we no longer feel that these are such issues. You know, now SubhanAllah, I was at one masjid a few years ago in Ramadan, and I was shocked that there was a boy who was accepting Islam, inshallah. His girlfriend's mom, girlfriend was Muslim, the mother brought him to the masjid. He accepted shahada. Afterwards, I was like in the lobby. The mother was saying, okay, you know, now we gotta hurry up. The, the store is closing, I'll take you guys out. SubhanAllah, in the month of Ramadan, we become so desensitized to what is an issue that now we are openly, SubhanAllah, from the parent, we're allowing this to occur. So we cannot become desensitized to this issue. Why? Because then it'll become normal. And what we have, what we see is with the desensitization of sins, we see that their prevalence also increases in the Muslim community. In 2013, there was a, a survey in Canada, and it said 53% of college students have, in the last month, consumed alcohol. There was something I think 46% had committed zina, or maybe it was, maybe the numbers were switched. And then there was another like 43 that had uh, engaged in other types of drugs. This was 10 years ago, we would say, now the Billah probably will only increase. Why? Because when sins are so public, then the Muslim community will also be suffering. When I brought up, when I said at the beginning the LGBT you know, acronym, people were laughing. But in reality, it's, we've already begun to, begin to see within the Muslim community this issue begins to rise. If we do not shine a light on this, if we don't recognize what's right and wrong, then by the time we are parents and our kids are in these seats, then this will become a problem that we don't know how to do right now. So I'll just have a few more points, and then we'll wrap up. The second thing is that the faculties which Allah Ta'ala has given us, the eyes through which we see, the tongue through which we speak, the ears through which we hear, these are all in reality gateways to a person's heart. So if a person is constantly speaking about, or say, like a person is constantly reciting Qur'an, they're constantly, you know, reading Qur'an through their eyes, they're hearing, you know, durus on, or halaqat on, on you know, Islam or on hadith, 
naturally that seeing and that hearing and that speaking will have a will take root in a person's heart. And a person will have an increased spirituality and an increased, inshallah, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we are seeing the sin, we're hearing about it being normalized. It's something that we no longer think about. We no longer, we just feel like, you know, it's something normal, what can we do about it? Then we would also think that these faculties through which we're seeing, hearing, and maybe even speaking about, that this will also take root in a person's heart. The last point that I'll say is that you know people can make the argument that you know maybe we just have to ally, maybe we need to sugarcoat things. But what happens is that over time the reason for, for certain actions are sometimes lost. You know, shirk and idol worship didn't just start from beginning to worship idols. It was a process, it was a generational uh, it was a response to over generations. Idea came to people, and you know, my father was such a gracious person. You know, why don't I just put his picture up? Why don't I just create like a little statue of him? And now, okay, now, why am I going to keep it in one room? Why don't I keep it in the prayer room, right? For example. And now, okay, my father was such a pious person. Why don't I begin to ask him as I, got, I ask Allah? And then it turned into why don't I just worship the idols? So over time, what started out as maybe an innocent thought, uh, okay, let me just remember my father and grandfather who was pious turn into something as serious as shit. If we say right now, we might understand or feel we understand the political implications of us not talking in a certain manner, or we feel like politically maybe we need to um, paint the picture in a certain way. The fear is that our kids, when they're growing up, they will know why they're And they'll say, oh, well, they're like that. So how about now? Um, my, one of my family members, they were saying that they had a halaqa for um, uh, middle school girls, maybe 12 to 14. I don't know how large the gathering was, but maybe you can say about 20 kids. And this issue was brought up about what do you think about this issue? In a masjid, in a city, mashallah, with a very well-established Muslim community, out of the 20 approximately attendees, no one had anything negative to say. Which means, number one, they lost the Islamic view on it, and now they didn't even realize it. This happens when we ourselves don't recognize, and we are careful about how we uh, address the issue. So now, what are the solutions? It all comes down to us, number one, deconstructing the ideology, and us remembering that we view the world through the Islamic viewpoint. For us to be able to do this and see the world, the world through the lens of that, but we also have to, you know, we have to not only talk, but we have to walk it. We have to be into increasing the And along with this, the other thing that a person is also having to be That now when you're confused about issues, have people that you know that you can look up to them, people that will tell you if you're wrong, so that this will be a team. With this, inshallah, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the words of Allah Ta'ala make them a benefit for us in this dunya and in the akhirah. And this, this conversation is much, one which is much, 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 much longer. Inshallah, I was asked, I was given a long list of getting into the historical, getting into the, you know, the ideological differences. Can't do everything in 30 minutes. But, but inshallah, this is at least beginning to open the door. So that either we individually can begin to explore or inshallah opens the doors for additional uh, programs in the future inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this gathering. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, protect our children, protect our families from any type of disobedience to Allah, be it in amal, be it in aqa'id, be it in any uh, normalization. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept. SubhanAllah, bihamdi, subhanakallah, Allah, bihamdi, nashadu, la ilaha, 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 la